Have you ever tried to make bread from scratch? I'm not talking about that packaged ingredients that you pour into a bread maker. Anybody ever try from scratch? Anybody ever fail? Man, I make bricks. <laughs> I know some of you are great cooks, but baking is another matter. Anyone ever try sourdough? And did you keep the starter? Is it a pet? Got a name? So I got into ba baking bagels at one point. Man, this is like the stuff for me. I absolutely love bagels, but don't bring me bagels because they, they're making me fat. Although you can't get a good bagel here. I've seen round bread with a hole in it, with the sprinklings on it. That is not a bagel. A bagel has to be proofed, then go hit water with the right ingredients in that water, then go into the oven. Only then, and if everything is perfect and precise, then it's a bagel. But people pretend, man, they, they make the round stuff. It just, it, it's not a bagel. It has to have that chewy texture to it on the outside. So I got into making bagels, and I thought, okay, not only do I love eating these things, making them's kind of fun too. I'm going to make a business. We're just going to go into business. I'm going to be the bagel king of my area. That's what I thought. I, I, until I priced that mixer. And I started doing the math, and I was like, what's the, what's the profit margin on a bagel? And then I was like thinking about the price of that mixer. You could buy a nice brand new car cheaper than that mixer costs. And you cannot deal with dough, the kind of dough, the thickness of the dough that a bagel requires with a regular mixer. That KitchenAid thing, it's going to die inside of an hour. It won't last. But when I started piecing it together, I realized and I was doing all this experimentation. I was like adjusting one variable or another. And you can't mess with two variables. It's only one. So you have to make a batch, test it out on your guinea pigs, and hope for the best and make adjustments. Get feedback. And that's just what I was doing. This is when I realized that the old adage is true. Cooking is an art. Baking is a science. Baking requires precision and it requires commitment to the details. Details matter. You can't fudge it. You can't just throw stuff in and say, poof, there's dinner, shut up and eat. No, you've got to make it exactly like the recipe is. And if you're figuring it out like I was, I had 14 recipes and I was taking pieces from each and I finally figured out what works for me and my bagels. But one mismove, one ingredient out of place, one direction not followed, it fails, and it's not there. So just as careful attention to a baking recipe makes things come out right, God also has a recipe, and it's for this world, and his recipe is perfect. And his recipe is called family. And he has made it family, the staple of society. It's what makes things tick. Each of us are meant to be a part of a family. And though each of us has varied experiences with family, both positive and negative, when his directions are followed and all the ingredients are in place, family creates a sweet aroma that attracts. Just the way that bagel smell wafted through the house and the kids came, when family's done right, it attracts. And just as God has a recipe for family, for society, and that's his recipe, is family, God's main intent is to include us into a spiritual family, his family. Now, last Sunday was Easter, and we celebrated the victory that we have in Jesus over our old enemies, death, hell, and the grave. And we have victory through Jesus if we trust in him and we 
we have victory over those enemies. We found that victory through his crucifixion, and we have hope in his resurrection that we too, as we grab hold of him by trust in faith, that we too will rise. Now, Jesus, he had the recipe, and he endured all of the labor of following that recipe, all of the pain, all of the humiliation, even death, for the joy set before him. What was that joy? That joy, that thing that he saw that motivated him through the pain and the difficulty and the trials that he went through to go all the way to death was seeing you. He could see you. And he saw a possible, preferable, alternative future for you if only you would grab hold of him and trust in him. That's what motivated him to do what he did. Jesus endured it all for your preferable future. Jesus made a way for you to start over with a new life and be included in God's family. Point number one, God wants you to be a part of his family. In Ephesians, Paul writes this in the first chapter. He says, even before God even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. This has been God's plan all along. He wants each of us to be a part of his family. God does everything through relationships. Relationships within the family dynamic. And here's what it looks like. He presents himself to us as father. This is how God makes himself known. He made the family the center of civilization. It began with two people. A man and a woman, they had children, and from them, the directive to fill the earth and subdue it, to rule over everything. And when they followed that, everything was right. And when they stopped in Shinar and tried to build a tower in the town of Babel, well, that was not right because God wanted the earth filled. When the recipes followed, everything is fine. God does everything through relationship. He, he started civilization with family, and he made it the center of civilization. He created a nation out of a family. And through the obedience of one man, whose name was Exalted Father. And then God breathed into him and changed his name to Abraham. And his name meant father of many though he had no children. But God calls those things that are not as though they were because our God is the God of the impossible. And he infused into that situation the possible. Just like your situation has elements of impossible, but God. When God's involved, something amazing takes place. He spoke into that man's life. He directed his steps. Abraham believed and followed the recipe. And there, a nation was born. A nation that would be special, set apart, holy, for the express purpose of bringing forth the Savior. And God brought the, the Savior into the world through a family. Jesus was brought into a family as an infant grew to be a man, growing in favor with God and others. And Jesus' work, when he set off in his ministry, was to make a way for us to return to God's family. That was his whole point. For you and I to come to know this great salvation found in his name and be included as brothers and sisters in God's family. That was the design. It was like that story of the prodigal son, where the son runs off to do his own thing, but realizes through consequence, oh, that's not working. 
and decides to return to the, to the Father. That's you and I. When we go our own way, we find the consequence of life, and then we realize this isn't working. Let's go back home because everything is right there. The Father waits for our return. He goes beyond what's expected or what's culturally normal. He's so excited about us returning to him and being a part of the family that he will make a fool of himself, so to speak, and run to us to meet us where we are. And in our shame, we will denounce our worthiness, and that's true, but he still puts on us that robe of righteousness that Christ won on the cross, takes our shame away, and includes us once again in the family. For many of us, the presentation of God as Father and talk of family, well, that leaves us less than enthused. Why? Because we often struggle with our memories. Our memories of family members or the lack thereof. We can't help but recall our own past and see where we came from. Some of you had great families growing up. God bless you, but many of us didn't. And it's hard sometimes to, to equate God as Father and to understand how to re relate to Him emotionally when our own understanding of Father was so messed up, or Mother. When we grow up in dysfunction, we begin to shy away. We shy away from engaging with the people of God, with the family of God, with the church, we isolate. Or we hover around, we're in the mix, we like the environment, it's got a good feel, and yet we never get too close and become a part of it. We're apprehensive. But when contrast comes, contrast allows us to see things. And the contrast of a new family, well, it sheds light on the shadows of the past. The new family is different, and it can bring healing. It can overcome the things that may even still be festering today from the past. A lot of times we, we create an identity based on our victimization or our abuse or our hurt and God has called us into his family to set us free from those things, to bring healing and release of the captives. But to become a member of God's family, you have to be born into it. There's, it's two angles. It's funny. You have to be born into it, but you're also adopted. It's, it's weird like that. But he talks about this with, with Nicodemus in, the, in a very familiar passage in John chapter 3. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night, and he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can somebody be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. But some may wonder, isn't everyone a child of God? And the answer to that is no. We are all his creation, and he is creator of all of us, for sure, no doubt. And the precision of our body and the, the composition and the predictability and the way that we're made gives testimony to our creator. And the deeper we dive into the minutia like the DNA, the more we see design and not chaos. Design from a designer and not randomness. 
God's our creator for sure, but he is not our father unless, and we are not his child unless we have been born again into his family. We must be born again through faith, putting our trust in Jesus to become a part of that family. And God's family is made up of those who also are born again and faithfully come together. And this is an, a crucial piece. Some people believe that their faith is private, that what I believe about God is between me and the man upstairs. And they try to play off this idea that they're good with God. Doesn't God have a say? Doesn't his opinion matter? How can we say we're good with God when we're absolutely ignoring him on every level? He purposed for us to be in relationship with each other as family. Gosh, you got to know your family's first name at least, right? This is important. That means sticking your hand out and saying, hi, my name's Scott. What's yours? It's like that. God purposed family like this. We're supposed to be involved in each other's lives. And here's the key. You can't become what God has purposed for you to become in isolation. You cannot. It's not how it's designed. That's not how it works. God's family is made up of all of us coming together under his heads, and we become his body, his church, his family. In Ephesians, again, Paul says in chapter 2, verses 19, Now you are no longer strangers to God and foreigners to heaven, but you are members of God's very own family, citizens of God's country, and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. Being born again is only the beginning you are not just called to believe, but to belong. That's an important piece. And there is a parallel between the things we learn in our natural family. There's a parallel with the spiritual family as well. There is a process of development that we are all to go through, and it requires a family. Point two, God wants you to embrace the development process within his family. When you enter this world, you're unaware. You're unconcerned with any plan or any expectations for your life. Babies will be babies. We enter this world and we're absolutely dependent, but we're demanding. We're self-centered and we care about nobody but ourselves. All we want is what we want and I want it right now. And if I don't get it, I'm going to scream and throw a little hissy fit and cry. And the irritation will motivate you to give me what I want. That's how a baby is. They don't care about you. Just give it what it wants right now. And so the process of development is a systematic move from teaching this baby to become a responsible adult who thinks about others. That's the goal. We cannot remain babies. The baby phase, by design, is supposed to be short. It's a funny thing as a parent because you're, you hold that child that you wanted and you're amazed by what God has done and the responsibility that he's entrusted to you. And then you couple that with lack of sleep and all kinds of craziness, an endless move of one diaper off that kid to the next, and, and you find yourself worn out, tired. Oh my gosh, it's so much dealing with a baby. And then it's over. And he was like, oh my God, what happened? We, did you take pictures? I forgot. Who took pictures? Where did this phase go? How will we remember this? And then somebody gets the idea, well, let's have another. <laughs> Boom, you're back. <laughs> but the baby phase 
It's so precious. They're so sweet-ish. <laughs> and it's amazing. It's amazing to partner with God in the development of a human. But it's not designed to last. And we can look back at those photos and we can mourn for the loss of that baby that we wish we still had that's now a mouthy kid, teenager, or whatever. But it's by design. We move on. But that's done in the context of family. Family matters. There are things we have to learn and we have to go and we have to progress. Family moves on. And the writer of Hebrews, probably Paul, he chided the believers there that were receiving his writing for not progressing in their faith. In Hebrews chapter 5, he says, well, we have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. We call this process of development discipleship. And it takes place within the context of God's family. There are developmental phases in God's family in our spiritual walk, just as there have been in our natural growing up. We have that newborn phase through toddler. This is where you're born, somebody's born into the family of God. They believe, they trust in Jesus, and they might be 70 years old, but they're finally a baby in God's house. And they know nothing and they care about nobody. They're only wanting what they want right now. And they start complaining, I don't like this and I don't like that. The music isn't to my taste and blah, 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 blah. Who cares? Almost. I don't know. <laughs> the baby phase in the spiritual life, it's about introductions and awareness. This is Father. This is mama. Can you say mama? It's all this, and, and we, we get them in the, the rhythm. We show them the routine of the family. Don't you know that babies are supposed to adapt to the routine of the family, not the family adapt to the routines of the baby? That's an important piece. We have to make sure the family and the purpose of the family is the primary directive, not the little tyrant that's in diapers. We teach, we counsel, we show them the way, and then they move, hopefully, into that childhood phase where they're gaining knowledge. They get the, through the Word app. They're starting to put it in. The Word's starting to go in. They're starting to understand. It's the what. I'm getting this. Okay, family. I'm, I'm starting to recognize faces. I know who's who in the family. Okay, good, okay. We, we're, we got this thing going. Then we progress to teenager. Okay, teenager. I, I'm a little more than exposed to this thing. I'm now starting to, to get some of these skills. Under, now I understand how. It's not just the what. Now I get the how. And I'm moving along. I'm, I'm starting to develop. I'm beginning to get perspective and see, oh, there's something more for me. I get this development process. And I push through with that. And you hit young adult. Now we start to get a little bit of perspective. We don't just know the what, and we don't just know how, but now we understand why. And we're like, okay, so there's a purpose, there's a reason. Okay, good, I get it. It's not just these things that we do and call it our Christian faith. No, there's a plan and a purpose. I get it now. And then we hit older adult. And then we, that's where conviction sets in, where I know what I know. This is what God said. I'm part of this family, and I'm helping to make this family move along. And I take responsibility, and I have this motivation to make family first. With God as the head. And sometimes we get so caught up 
in the place where we're at, in the phase that we're in, and we linger too long. Maybe we get to an area, a level of proficiency in that phase and we feel comfortable and it's smooth and we don't have to hardly even think anymore and we just kind of coast in that and our development is stunted. All of a sudden, development is arrested and that is an abnormal state. We are not supposed to be stunted in our development but continuing to grow and that only happens by becoming mature and we only become mature as we interact with each other and we follow the prescription the recipe letter by letter and as we interact with each other as we interact with people outside of our four walls of our family home only then do we become mature We have to keep progressing. As parents, we often forget that the goal of our kids' development is responsible adult. And sometimes we hover over them, we helicopter, we try to prevent every bad thing from happening. We don't want them to fall or get bruised or hurt. We don't want them to have a bad grade, because how does that reflect on me as a parent? Everybody knows you did the, the report. Oh, and the, the solar system diagram thing on foam board? Yeah, that was you too. We know it. The kid doesn't have the skills. The teacher knows that too. Right, Danica? Yes. <laughs> we have to let them fail. Let them get bad grades. Let them get in trouble now while the consequences are small so that they don't find themselves protected all the way to adulthood, and then suddenly they're in jail, or worse. Let them fail now. That's what a responsible parent does, understanding the developmental process. They need this, and I have failed at this. I didn't want my kids to screw up. I didn't want them to embarrass me. I, there were so many pieces to this. And I didn't force them to do chores because they couldn't do it as good as me, so I just did it for them. Mistake, right? You got to do the right thing, and sometimes that's letting them get hurt so that they will mature. Keep the long-range goal in mind, maturity. And we, as we are God's kids... He won't let us forget that we are in process. Point three. God wants you to take the next step on your path to maturity. In Hebrews chapter six, Paul said, or whoever wrote it, says, let us stop going over the same old ground again and again, always teaching those first lessons about Christ. Let us go on instead to other things and become mature in our understanding as strong Christians ought to be. Surely we don't need to speak further about the foolishness of trying to be saved by being good or about the necessity of faith in God. You don't need further instruction about baptism and spiritual gifts and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. The Lord willing, we will go on now to other things. What does maturity look like? Ultimately, Christ is our image of maturity. The process of becoming mature leads us from self-focus to seeing others and, and seeing our interdependence. That's a key piece. But growth requires change. We don't like change, but that's the necessity. We have to. If we're green, we're growing. If we're not, we're dead. We have to be growing, and we have to expect and anticipate and even embrace change. God makes it clear that putting his instruction into practice is the way to maturity. In James, James, the brother, half-brother of Jesus, who became the leader of the church in Jerusalem, he wrote and says, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Other people, 
Other people are dependent upon your growth. This is that interdependence piece. If you do not grow because you're stalled out, arrested development, it will affect others who are counting on your development. You can't grow in isolation. You need your church family in order to grow. And interacting and serving with others will open up growth points. Often someone needs to move out so that we can move up, so we can take on more responsibility, but not here at SMCC. We have this continual cycle of turnaround where people are coming and going. And I, as a pastor, I'm not used to this yet. But I know that wherever you've come from, this is that next phase for you. This is that opportunity for you to go up a notch and into a new level of responsibility to gain greater maturity. That's what you're here for. And those of you that are leaving, that place where you're going, that's your next phase. Where you will practice further what you've already learned, but you will take on more and you will grow and develop and become something more mature. If you want to be stepping up, this place has opportunities. Yes, we're starting to map out things and to get people plugged in into the areas of need, but it's not just that the church needs to supply these ministries and, and we're looking for volunteers and all like that. If you do not volunteer, you will remain a baby and I will keep casting milk your way. But if you step up and you get involved, then you grow. You grow through the irritation by trying to minister with other people that you don't enjoy being around. When the area of your ministry has difficulty and you can't figure it out, you grow. When there are things that happen in these opportunities, you grow. You can't sit like a bump on a log in the chair and grow. Things will grow on you rather than you growing. I've seen it. It's moss. It'll be on the north side of you. <laughs> Honestly, here's my plug for volunteerism. Praise God. One of the goals that we have had in the children's ministry is to try to find six competent leaders so that the rotation is only having to serve every six weeks. That's easy. That's not even 12 times a year. That was our goal. God is supplying that. Now our area of need is helpers. People just to be like crowd control. That's it. And we need check-in people. In, in the music department, we need double in all positions. The media team needs help as well especially in live stream and, and areas where we're going to lose some people. We need help in youth. There needs to be people who can connect with the youth and have a growing relationship with Jesus. And first impressions is an area where it's easy to get involved, but we miss the importance of this area. All of us have the opportunity to do something in service that has eternal significance. Does your job matter in a hundred years? Most of you don't even remember who your great-great-grandfather's name was. So what's significant about him? Don't know. And your job, what you're doing, will it matter in a hundred years? Nations rise, nations fall, things change. That has been the pattern, and the historical record shows it. But when you get involved in ministry and church, in the family of God, what you do has eternal significance that reverberates forever. When you are involved in first impressions, sometimes the person that's far from God enters in, and they find that they're not so put off by Christians in the Christian way because you do your job right and maybe at one point as they're listening they find 
that faith is building up inside of them and they have the courage to trust Jesus for, for salvation and they come into the family of God born again because you served, because you did your job right and you are a part of bringing somebody into eternity with God into the family. That's the stuff that matters. Are you engaged in that way? Are you engaged in a way that is lending to your development? Or are you stalled in your development? And what do you need to do in the context of family, spiritual family, that is mutually beneficial for personal and family development? I want to ask Jobert to come and play a little bit. Family is hugely important to God. His intent all along, before you were ever born, was that you would be part of his family. He paved the way for that. And God uses his church for our mutual edification. To grab hold of God's plan for your life, you have to take the next step. Are you a part of God's family? You must be born again. It seems so simple. There's nothing to do. You don't do anything. It's done. You don't win God's favor and try to gain acceptance because you start from a position of affirmation. God already loves you. He doesn't approve of the junk you're doing but he loves you and he wants you in the family. You don't got to do anything to earn it. Just trust. Put your faith in Jesus. That's it. And then you will be born again. It's a mystery. But those of you that are in the family, are you committed to the family? Or are you like a teenager that's only seeing themselves gone, out somewhere? Are you committed to the family, God's family? And what is your next step of development? What is the thing that takes you to that next level? How do you progress? What, what is your next step? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you have called us to be a part of your family. God, your family is different than the family that we grew up in. We still have our issues in the family and, and sometimes we offend and there is hurt. And some of us have past hurts within a church setting. But that wasn't you. That was people baking without the recipe. God, I pray for any who have tried church in the past and, that is, and it's brought pain and hurt, maybe even shame. I pray that, Lord, you would show them the contrast of what you really meant by family. Do that amongst us. Help us to see what you intended. Help us to taste and see that your family is good. God, I pray that you would bring healing to those that have had hurts in the past. Hurts with family, hurts with church. And God, I pray that you would, would show us all the possible, preferable family and future that you have for us. God, I pray for those that have been far from you, that they would come near through trust, through faith. Make that decision of their will to choose to trust Jesus and to receive what they couldn't produce on their own. 
I pray, God, that you would bring many to salvation. And God, I pray for all of us that we would commit to the long haul with your family. Sometimes we're here in this area, and sometimes we've come from another, and sometimes we're going to still another. But no matter what, let there be continuity and commitment to your family wherever you take us. Because we recognize your family's big, but you have room for more, and you're anticipating more. Let us not be arrested in our development, God, but God, I pray that we would find ourselves continually growing and bearing fruit, fruit with seed in it, fruit that lasts. God, I pray that you would speak to everyone in here and show each of us what that next step is and give us the courage to take it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.